Okay, welcome everybody to another episode of Junior Resource Investing, the podcast dedicated to deepening your understanding of the junior resource sector and some important and exciting plays within it. As always, I'm your host, Matthew. Just a disclaimer, please remember that this is not financial advice. Neither myself nor my guests are financial advisors. This podcast is for entertainment purposes only. For full disclaimer, please check the YouTube notes below. With that out of the way, though, I'm pleased to present our latest guest, Sean Samson. President and CEO of EV Nickel. EV Nickel is a nickel explorer in the Shaw Dome region just outside of Timmins, Ontario. There is a strong history of nickel in the region. EV Nickel's own land packages have seen roughly 60 million pounds of nickel production historically, and neighboring packages have roughly another 60 million pounds of nickel resource. They've had some strong assays, but as of yet are pre resource. Toll mills and permitted mill sites are in the immediate region, and they trade on the TSXV under the ticker EVNI. Sean, this is our first time chatting face to face. It's nice to finally meet you. How are you doing today? Great. Uh, thanks for having me on, Matthew. And it is great to see your face after our calls. Yeah, absolutely. I, I appreciate you coming on the show. So my my interviews always kind of start out thirty thousand foot view, the very kind of generic inter- introduction to the company, and then in the second half we kind of drill into more company specific questions. So the question I always start out with is. 30-second elevator pitch on EV Nickel. Why is it compelling? Why should investors care? Uh, okay, let, let me preface that with a five-second disclaimer on what I'm going to say. So uh, everything I'm saying has been previously disclosed, and it's available on our website. And uh, with that disclosure on our website, especially on our investor deck, you can see um, our, our legal statement about forward uh, forward-looking statements, of which I'll try to do very few, and the few that I will do are in line with what we've already disclosed. So our, our company, EV Nickel, we formed this a couple of years ago, actually last year, uh, where we spun out a non-core asset from another company. And we're positioning ourselves. It's very interesting. We have a huge land package now in northern Ontario, just outside of Timmins, uh, at which we have, we have known mineralization and a huge amount of exploration potential. And we're developing now down two tracks a high grade track where we already have a resource on the books from 2010, an historic resource, which we'll be updating very soon. We'll talk about that. Uh, that's great, 1% grade nickel. So high grade, that's my track one. Track two is I have a, I have a very interesting option across the Northern part of my property where we're, we've drilled a, a large scale, we call it also known as low grade, a, a, an enormous large scale target, which will be coming out with a resource on uh, early next year. So we have those two tracks, the high grade and the large scale. Um, the high grade, we're applying for permits now, and we do, as you mentioned, have nearby processing. We think we could generally be in production there in three to four years. So I've got my high grade track, and then I've got my large scale track. And that's the really interesting thing, but uh, we're where, where you wanna be uh, in Ontario. And we've got a high grade and a large scale option. Excellent. So, I mean, this is a, a resource podcast. So obviously people listening to this have kind of pre-selected out of people interested in the resource sector. But do you mind just for setting the table for the conversation, you know, wanna, do you want to run through the bull thesis for nickel as you see it over the next zero, five, ten 10 years? Yeah, I don't spend a ton of time on the macro because I assume people sort of come mm. to it for reasons beyond which they'll be looking for a, a nickel CEO to pitch them on my metal. Uh, but they're, the reason I'm involved, which I guess I can speak to, um, is I, I think there's a lot of tailwinds here for a, a positive future market for nickel broadly and more specifically within nickel, uh, nickel from um, Western jurisdictions like Canada places where you can get permitted, which were pretty bulletproof on the ESG. And then, and we'll talk about this, a big part of what we're planning to do is try to be bottom quartile for carbon cost per nickel unit. So nickel, uh, broadly speaking, right now it's a stainless steel metal. You know, the majority of of nickel um, goes to China to be made into stainless steel and, you know, comes back in frying pans to Walmart. Um, that's, That's nickel now. Um, with the extraordinary uh, demand growth people are forecasting across electric vehicles and nickel being a core component of the current winning battery chemistry, which I'm sure we'll talk a bit about, um, 
that has a lot of go forward nickel demand. And when you bolt that on top of the stainless steel, which has, you know, more cyclical type growth rates of 3% or so, when you, when you put uh, the EV demand on top, they think by about 2030, 2035, global nickel will flip from being a stainless steel story to an EV battery story. So um, we're trying to position ourselves right in there for that. Um, as I mentioned, with the high grade, which we think will be in a production nearer term on, but then also this, this large scale option. I think we've got it in the right place in the world and it's the type of mineralization which will be able to play directly into that as people are going to become uh, more and more aggressive trying to find the supply to answer the demand around those EV, uh, the EV batteries. So that's my bullish case for nickel. Um, I, I think nickel is going to begin uh, very soon. We've seen it already with sort of the class one and other, the differentiation within nickel, but I think it's going to go even further within class one, the sulfides. You're going to start seeing a split based on the things I mentioned, whether it's uh, geographic location for geopolitical reasons, uh, general ESG checks, or as is very quantifiable, the carbon cost attached to every nickel unit. So based on those three things, I think for those that are developing the demand, and we'll talk about this with the car companies, the battery companies, their world of potential supply is becoming a, a smaller place and we're within those guardrails. Excellent. And all those things, as you kind of referenced yourself, EV settles itself nicely into those things, right? Situated quite nicely with these things. Yes. So uh, transitioning personal history for yourself, right? Previous positions that you've held and then maybe end it with how did you end up at EV Nickel? Yeah. So um, as I think about how I got to where I, where I am, um, you know, what I'm talking about now is, is more than just your typical uh, junior minor, I hope to have metal on the ground and maybe I'll hit something big and be taken out by a major, you know, your, your typical junior, junior minor promotional story. Mm -hmm. Mine has a lot more to it in terms of the geopolitical, um, what's happening specifically within our metal with going with the harder ESG and the, the really rethinking everything to have the lowest carbon cost. There's a lot happening in my small little company. And I think that's actually reflective of sort of how I got here. So I began my career, I went to university in the States. I'm from Southern Ontario, but I went down to Harvard for undergrad, graduated with a lot of uh, student debt, which immediately had me go work in uh, financial markets. So I traded at investment banks for the first uh, uh, few years of my career. Um, and then I went to business school in the UK um, and, and I came out and didn't know what I wanted to do necessarily industry-wise. So I worked in consulting and private equity at Bain so I was at uh, Bain and Company in Toronto, but doing most of my work in Latin America um, and doing general consulting. So jumping from one industry to the next. And, and after sort of 10 years into my career, um, I hit a point where I wanted to go back out in the industry. And um, I found myself at Kinross Gold. So um, with I was working for the CFO uh, in a small group that came into the company after they'd done a three-way merger and we're sort of a collection of juniors bolted together. And next thing you know, we were producing 2 million ounces of gold with properties all around the world. And I came in as a general commercial guy, uh, mainly because of my background in private equity. And I sort of dropped right in and mining for a Canadian kid who'd spent majority of his working career to that point, working abroad. Um, I realized how important the resource biz is to our economy and to our country. And I also realized how, how interesting it was in that hard rock, precious metals world, especially that the Canadian companies are broken up at then uh, into two groups of people. There were people who get really excited about rocks and trucks. So those are the geologists and the engineers. And then there's investment bankers. Uh, and I was neither. I worked at investment banks, but I was a trader. Um, and I sort of ran up the middle and there was a huge amount of potential to do all the things commercial. Um, across Kinross and really learn the mining business, sort of separate the deal side and, and alongside the, the guys running the mines. So I did everything commercial um, from buying all the inputs to um, moving the material around the world uh, to get it to our mines so they could run. Um, I was the chief risk officer. It was really a holistic uh, exposure to all things mining in those Kinross five years there. 
Um, I left Kinross because uh, a small group of us disagreed with the transaction the company did. Uh, we left and went out to a junior at that point. Um, that was absolutely the right call to sort of get off the bus when we did from Kinross. What was not the right call, Matthew, was we went into a, a nickel junior, um, which was owned by private equity, which was good news because we were financed. But um, just at the point where nickel was really running and then it sort of fell out of bed. So that was first nickel. We ran a deep underground mine outside Sudbury and alongside Resource Capital Fund, our main investors, um, RCF had us looking at buying additional base metal assets around the world. So we did a huge amount of review and due diligence and trying to get um, assets across their investment committee. We spent a huge amount of time with that private equity group, Resource Capital Fund, while we were running our deep underground mine outside of Sudbury. Um, and it was a really neat exposure for me. For six months, I was the COO as well, uh, which was a wonderful experience. Um, but the nickel price just fell right out of bed. And first nickel got shut down at that point. Um, and then I moved out of that into another junior called Rogue Resources, which I've been running for the past six years. Um, Rogue was originally an industrial minerals company where we had focus on quartz. Um, and then also in our portfolio, we had a Timmins asset with really interesting nickel in the ground. But the really good part of Rogue was I was able to come in with the geologist who came with me from First Nickel, Paul Davis. And together we've been running Rogue for a bunch of years. Rogue has now pivoted into becoming a very boring cash flowing business where we have landscape stone quarries. Um, and that continues to be um, a job for me where Paul and I run Rogue Resources. But Paul uh, is an expert on the Cabatiates, um, which is specifically the geology where um, E.V. Nichols property has, or the geology we have. And Paul spent over 20 years of his career as the guy in Timmins, a gold camp, looking for nickel. So Paul had always been, you know, a voice in my ear that we need to do something special and separate with our asset in Timmins. Commercially, I saw where the nickel market was going. Geologically, Paul saw the enormous potential of this land south of Timmins. So together, we, we spun that non-core asset out from Rogue and um, created EV Nickel. And that's sort of a, a, a long response to your question about how I personally got here and how it meshes with sort of what we're doing. But what we're doing has a lot to it. And I think that draws on a big chunks of my career where I've done you know, very varied things. And I have a real capacity for trying to think, work through complex challenges and build something out of it. So that's, um, that's really what we're doing with EV Nickel. And it makes us quite special as well. We're in the other thing that's happening in the nickel business right now is a split within the actual products. So the nickel units people are selling, especially with a focus on carbon cost. Um, but also we're partnering more downstream. So it's becoming commercially uh, more complex than it has been in the past, wherein, you know, I routinely am meeting with car companies um, in Europe, in Asia. There's a lot to it. And there's a lot of sort of complexity now as you've got these other market players who see what's happening in the market uh, who want to get involved. And all of that really draws, Matthew, on, on my background and sort of um, my experiences and my exposure up until this point. Excellent. I mean, you're, you're, you're elusive. You're, you are very effectively kind of putting the pieces in place here, right? You know, like you say, a bit of a, a detailed answer, but yeah, very, thank you for that. Yeah. Uh, good, good discussion about all the different aspects that are coming into play here. Uh, maybe let's just circle back really quickly. You talk about Paul, but maybe can you introduce, introduce us to her team and maybe focus on, as you say, regional experience, maybe discoveries in the area or, or relevant discoveries and maybe some, any M and a success that you can reference. Yeah. So across my, my exploration team, I have two key guys, Paul, who spent over 20 years of his career. And I have heard from other CEOs in the Timmins camp that so many roads lead back to Paul because in his time up there, he worked for Otokompu and Falcon Bridge. And again, he was the guy looking for nickel in this gold camp. And he actually staked many of these properties initially. So his, his 
sort of fingerprints are all over what's happening in the Timmins camp now with, uh, you know, there's, there's a few of us publicly traded nickel companies um, that are advancing projects up there. Um, one of which is the Alexo Dundonald. Um, Paul discovered uh, the main zone um, that class one nickel is, uh, is working on. Um, that's one of five different uh, nickel sulfide discoveries Paul had in the Timmins camp. Um, he also successfully advanced projects from discovery through to production in, in private hands. Um, so Paul's got a, a huge amount of experience sort of on the ground up there. And then academically, he did his master's specifically on the Kamadiates, uh, comparing our Shaw Dome area, so south of Timmins, exactly where we have the land now, um, with the Kambalda in Western Australia, which we talk a lot about the similarities. And it's not just, you know, CEO arm waving. It's it's backed up by Paul's master's thesis uh, with, the, with the genuine link between the two. And of course, the Cabalda has produced over 50 million tons of nickel since the 60s. So, you know, if we're accurate with that, if we're even close to accurate with that, we're sitting on, you know, a proper new high-grade nickel sulfide district across our property, which has never really been uh, explored and properly produced. You, you mentioned before our historic production in where we are down in the Shaw Dome, but that was really just sort of boom bust production, you know, mm -hmm. the high points. And I say this as a guy who ran a producing nickel company that then had to shut down because of the busts. Um, it, you know, nickel was produced at the peaks and it wasn't properly explored out to have that sort of uh, have that runway out in front of you. Um, so that's that's really the, the play here is pulling all the land together and finding that runway. And, and Paul specifically is, is very well uh, experienced in that um, and and has been talking about this for ages. And it's so exciting to pull together the land package with Paul uh, because we can finally get going on this thing he's been talking about. Separate from Paul, uh, we have Phil Vicker, who also worked with us at First Nickel. That's where I met him. He worked with Paul for many years before that. Phil is up in Timmins, runs our exploration program up there. Um, Phil's background before First Nickel was uh, many years with Falconbridge, where he was up at Raglan. Um, so he was on the team there, um, which is very, it's very interesting similarities between what we're talking with our high grade in these commodities where deposits are found along these flows. The Raglan system is, is similar with, with deposits in sequence. Uh, and that's really what, what Phil's thing is. And Phil's on the ground up there, managing our exploration team, working for Paul. Um, and he, he's a wonderful resource to have. And very important for me is pulling together a team uh, with folks that I've known for a long time. Mm. And, and Phil is someone, when I was up managing the mine for First Nickel, Phil was uh, our main geologist up in Sudbury. So that was many years that I've worked directly with him. And Paul spent much of his career with him. Um, so that's really our, our core geological team. We have um, local guys up in Timmins that are under Phil. And then our drilling contractor is a Timmins-based company um, who we've had tremendous success with, NPLH. Um, and, and Phil is the one managing them. Um, but really, that's, that's, the, that's the EV nickel team. And that's really a big part. Obviously, I'm somebody talking about hard assets. My land is a big uh, benefit to the team but it's really the combination of the land with the team that I think sets us apart. Um, and again, Matthew, as I mentioned at the start, I hear this from other CEOs up there that they'd be very interested in getting their hands on that same team, if you know what I mean. Mm -hmm. Well, I think it's a point well made, right? That a lot of the time it is spent on geology and a lot of focus and justifiably so, but ultimately in the end, and I guess this is it for a lot of different industries, it's the soft skills like mutual trust and relationships and finding a team that you can work with for years upon years that, yeah, that, that, that does matter. Right. So no, thank you. Uh, let's just switch gears here. Kind of get back to more of a business side aspect, mm -hmm. just, an, and I'll pull up from your slide deck here too, for people watching on YouTube, but can you just run through share structure for us? You have a nice tight float. Can you run through, just break it down for us and then maybe extend that to any warrants or options that are outstanding as well? Yeah. So share structure, we are tight, as you say, uh, and we're pretty straightforward, too. So our, our rounds of financing are, are wonderful news for someone who hasn't come into the stock yet. Um, but it sort of tells a, a, a tough tale of, 
us having sold shares in, in a tough market. So we have 40, just under 44 million shares outstanding. Um, the way we get there is there was originally uh, a founders group of guys from Toronto who financed the spin out from Rogue, um, mainly Toronto, I should say, uh, plus Rogue Resources, the other company. So in combination between those two, it's, it's about uh, 16, 17 million shares, which are on a, a three-year escrow with those shares gradually coming out in the market. But that's 17 of the just under 44. And then we had a few rounds of financing. So in March of 2021, last year, um, we did a 30 cent round. So that was just under 7 million shares. Uh, then we did our IPO in December of last year. That was at 75 cents. This is a theme I'll come back to. Uh, that was another 7 million shares that went out the door. We did a wonderful transaction earlier this year with the privately held company that owns a lot up on the Shaw Dome, uh, where we tripled our land package by buying a big chunk of land. They got 2.5 million shares as part of that transaction in April of this year. Um, and then we did a flow-through round at the beginning of the summer, which part was charity, so it was $0.18 cents and $0.24. Cents. Um, and 11 million shares went out the door on that. So that gets us down to the 43.9 million shares um, that are basic shares outstanding. On top of that, we have like 10% uh, options have gone out. So we've got the exact numbers in front of me, but I, I think it's four or 5 million. Um, but consistent with all the shares we sold, those are well out of the money as well. Um, wherein everything is deeply underwater. Um, and, you know, Charitably, I, I describe that as being us having done an IPO in very difficult uh, markets because we, we came out in the first half of this year, of course, you know, everybody thought the market was on, uh, you know, was burning. And we had liquidity in the stock that people had just paid 75 cents per share for in an IPO. And there was a lot of dumping in the first half of this year. So uh, that has pushed us down. Um, during that time, we tripled our land package. We had very successful uh, phases of drill results we came out with, and we continue to. And our stock has been sort of frozen down around the 15 cent level. Um, so that's where we are today. We've got a tight float, as you say. Uh, we, we know where much of the stock is, and much of the stock is, is locked up on these escrows. That April vendor also had an escrow agreement. This is all in our slides. Um, but the, then the publicly trading stock which much of it went into the hands of, of retail, um, that has been a lot of turnover from, from, my, from my perspective. Um, institutionally, we had four small Toronto institutions um, come in on the private round last year, and they also came in on the IPO. So we had uh, four Toronto-based institutions who uh, really buttressed both of those transactions. Then my flow through this summer, uh, Sprott was both the back end and the investor on a big chunk of that. Um, but other than that, we are high net worth and, and more broadly across sort of general retail. Um, insider ownership, we refer to management board, owns about 5% um, of the company. Uh, and then we have broadly defined friends and family is about 25%. And part of that friends and family is the Rogue Resources owning 6.6. Uh, about half of Rogue Resources shares are in the hands of friends and family. So we've got a big chunk of the company that is you know, very close. Um, in addition, I, I will highlight as well, when we did the IPO at 75 cents, um, a lot of that was purchased by friends and family. I, I think you probably know this dynamic where you have to have 200 uh, investors who, who buy a qualifying block. Um, and, and the vast majority of that came directly actually from my network. So I have, I have huge exposure with people who own the stock and the consistent theme, which I, I alluded to earlier, the consistent theme is it's all well underwater at 15 cents. So um, again, as I started, Great news for new investors because mm -hmm. everybody who's inside uh, and those with whom the insiders interact, friends and family, everybody is closely aligned to ensure that this thing goes up um, because we're, we're, we're deeply underwater. Like if I think about an average cost 
um, on the founders round. That was obviously cheap stock at the beginning, but those guys also came in at 30 cents and at 75 cents, and now we're down at 15. Mm -hmm. So um, basically nobody's happy, right? Um, and the, the nice way to refer to that is we're all very well aligned to try to get the stock back up. Well, and it's the whole sector, right? It's hardly just EV's sole issue that the whole sector, whole junior resource yeah. space has just been beat up for, I mean, months now, right? And it's one of those things that, I mean, it's not, I'm not here to give anybody investment advice, but why, if, I think too many people get caught in the trap of buying high and selling low, right? When it sounds, but yeah, that this this is a time where you start finding cash in the couch cushions to, to find yeah. a, a bigger position, right? And we can uh, talk about that cash in the couch cushions. That's an excellent... Uh... Segue. You want to, so we've also we have no debt, and our, our last disclosed financials we were around three million of cash. Uh, we're, we're less than that now, um, but we're but we're well set up for you know the technical spend through to the end of this year at least. So my intention of having done the flow through at the beginning of the summer was to get us that runway, and obviously you know everything's decision making with the cash I have on the couch right now. We can shut down the technical spend and run the company for many years. Um, but, you know, my hands are tied somewhat with it being having been flow through. But more importantly, we want to keep, you know, pedal down mm. on, on getting results. So, um, you know, it's as, as I, as I, I like always say, you know, drilling now is the news for six months from now. Um, or, or met work in the lab now is news for six months from now. So that's just the way you have to be running a junior miner. Um, it's not like many financiers think, um, you know, if you could just shut down spending or if you spend now, you should be able to talk about it. It's like something that the management team actually has to have is always that sort of six month window where the reason you raise is to have future news, not to have news on Monday. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so I guess maybe on that note, what, when you are exploring, what is your burn rate? Yeah. So the way I refer to it is. All in, all in per meter, uh, we're 250 bucks. Okay. Which I know it's not a popular way to say it might sound like a big number because people don't talk about the all in, all in. Um, but 250 covers, um, you know, the assays, uh, the transportation, um, the drilling, the owner's team. That, that's, that's how much my drill programs cost 250, which, um, I spent a lot of time drilling within companies, not from like the investor perspective, but within companies, I can tell you 250 per meter, all in, all in, um, is, is, is very good. And it actually speaks to partially back to my location, right? Like mm -hmm. my drillers at the drill contractor, they love our job because they can staff it with guys who sleep at home at night. So mm -hmm. it's, it's a polar opposite of a fly in fly out, uh, or even, uh, other Timmins based, um, drill programs, which themselves are fly in, fly out because of the conditions. So where we're drilling, especially up in this Car Lang, the, the large scale target we did this summer, everything had been clear cut. Uh, so the, the drillers and me, we were able to drive right up to the drill rig uh, because the, the loggers had been in there over the last five years. And they built a tremendous uh, network of roads. So geographically, we're you know, close to a city. Uh, which is good news for our drill costs. Uh, and then, you know, conditions wise, um, it's, it's an excellent setup for drilling where we are. And all that really contributes back into, and the performance of our contractors as well, they churn out a lot of meters, um, gets me that, that 250 per meter is how I love mm. it. Well, and you speak well to it, right? We, uh, the next question here I have is a discussion of jurisdictional and for you, it's not jurisdictional risk so much as it is jurisdictional advantages. And you've kind of covered it, right? That you are exactly where you'd want to be if you're going to be a, a explorer, pre-developing explorer, right? That you are very, you have clean roads. You can drive to where you want to go. Like you say, people sleeping in their beds at night. Uh, you've got like, you have an operating mine or, you know, close to operational mine, like, I mean, minutes away, right? Is there anything yeah. else that you maybe, maybe you want to highlight for us in terms of why jurisdictionally this is such an advantage for EV? Yeah. Hey, it's, um, so operating mine wise, um, you may be referring to like, um, you know, Newmont's operations and Timmins, which are enormous. Uh, mm. we're, we're just south of the, of the, of the dome mine. Mm. So just to our north, there's, you know, world-class mining production. You, you know, when, when I'm up at Timmins and I'm staying in the, 
uh, saying in the hotel directly across the street is the sign for the community, but when they're blasting in the Hollinger pit. So it is Timmins is a supportive mining town, and we are a very short drive down to where we're drilling. And I think it's it's wonderful now when we're employing, you know, um, owner's team and contractors, a couple dozen guys. Uh, it'll be even better when we're up into proper operations and that number is like 250 and, and they're all going home to, to, to a proper life. So the benefits of that are, are very good at the exploration stage, incredible at the operation stage. So, and again, that's, that's where we're hoping to be headed. Right. Um, mm. But then more broadly about that sort of geography and proximity to a city. And there's all kinds of benefits in terms of, you know, Timmins has everything you need to operate a mine nearby from because there are so many existing mines. But then specifically our location, um, I mentioned that we've got this tremendous road network. Um, we're, we're the absolute opposite of having to chopper in to do the drilling. Um, we also have, and, and this is gonna be a big issue on these large scale. So when we come out with our Carlang resource, I hope next year, uh, and we have a big number, we can then compare these low grade or large scale resources against other ones. And um, the fact that ours is all clear cut, that's a benefit, especially now when you're drilling. But the other real benefit of you know, geographically where we are with that large scale target is we have significant outcrop. And the outcrop combined with the mineralization we're finding uh, is very close to surface. It, when we're talking about potential mineralization you're going after, that's going to be 0.25 or 0.3% nickel. If you need to go through 40 meters of overburden to get down to that mineralization, it really makes it mm -hmm. not apples to apples. Mm -hmm. So our large scale, the location we're at, with it having been clear cut is great for drilling. The fact that I think we're going to average less than 10 meters of overburden is, is a big deal. And it's a big deal because if we're talking about you know, mining dirt, which is what 0.25 is. So you're in a massive earth moving exercise. If you have to go through 40 meters to get down to that dirt, mm -hmm. that really adds a lot of cost to something you're just trying to make sure it's economic. Mm -hmm. So geographically, I love being near a city. Specifically, I love the site of my large scale because um, it's got this clear cutting thing and outcrop and minimal overburden. But then coming back out, thinking about permitting, um, and support of jurisdiction. Um, you know, from a permitting perspective, we've had multiple conversations and they're proper dialogues. They're not just, as I've seen in other jurisdictions, which is company talks to uh, government, government doesn't show their cards, um, and then government surprises you down the road. We're having a proper dialogue with both the provincial and the federal. And it's really interesting in Ontario right now, because even though politically you have two ends of the spectrum, or I shouldn't say ends of the spectrum, you have uh, conservatives and centrists, the liberals and the feds, um, they are completely aligned with this critical minerals thing. Mm -hmm. um, and provincial especially, you know, we have met with the mines minister. Um, we're in very regular contact with the mines minister's office. The mines minister, Minister Peary, was the former mayor of Timmins, right? And he himself used to work in mining companies and when we sit down to talk to the minister, Minister Peary knows more about the Shaw Dome geology than, frankly, I do, right? So he talks to Paul about the geology of the Shaw Dome because he spent his life in the Timmins mining camp. And to have that person in the seat of the Ontario Mines Minister, is, is it's excellent. So um, where we're located, you know, big picture, when I go to Europe and I talk to the car companies, um, and they, they know... They want to be in Canada and they love the idea of Canada or Australia and the proximity of Canada to the European uh, future demand is even better. But then once you start peeling that onion and getting into the actual details, mm -hmm. it, it's really an incredible situation now where we have complete alignment between the feds and the province within the province. There's incredible industrial experience um, and it's just, everybody's aligned and that's just not, I, I say that as well as someone who, in the other company, Rogue Resources, were potentially going into litigation against the province of Quebec, which is because they completely moved the goalposts on us and went back on things that they told us publicly. 
uh, on not being able to permit a project we had there. That's a whole sort of long, dirty story. But the really interesting thing is Quebec has such a huge high rating in the Fraser Institute, but I will really think twice about going back to operate in the province of Quebec. Hmm. And one of the things I think about it, Matthew, we never sat down in the five years we were trying to evolve our project with the mining's minister. Yeah. You know? We didn't actually get in the room where it happens. In Ontario, with the cooperation from the feds, it's polar opposite, totally different. That's my personal experience. I know they're very similar in sort of the global rankings. And when the European car companies talk to us, they just think Canada. It's like, no, 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 it's even better. It's like, let me explain to you how mm. we stand currently in Ontario, working with Ottawa. It's, it's you know, everybody's going in the, everybody's pulling in the same direction. Excellent. Uh, just to extend on a on a point you made about the Critical Minerals Initiative, I mean, we even have Christian Freeland just days ago speaking in D.C., I believe, talking about the need to accelerate and expedite, uh, you know, national resources such as nickel, right? So, I mean, yeah, just lots of, yeah. I mean, we talked about this at the start. It's not it's not the interview for a long-winded discussion of macro events, but, I mean, yeah, it's just the pieces are there, right? Pieces are absolutely yeah. there. Yeah. Um, and, 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 I, and I see it, I see it in every meeting. And um, the other thing, Matthew, which I, I don't want to go down another digression, but the, the other sort of grander geopolitical thing is, um, and investors should start picking up on this as well, because the, the new demand, uh, I'll tell you, um, I was at a, I spoke at a conference in Spain three weeks ago with most of the European car companies. It was raw materials for electric vehicles in Europe. And it, it's very interesting to me, the change in tone Um you know, in September versus um, I last caught up with these guys face to face in January. And in that period of time, uh, there has become a real concern around where specifically the nickel is going to come from. You know, the cobalt price spike and sort of the ESG baggage that cobalt comes with has led in the battery chemistry sort of labs, them thrifting out a lot of the, the cobalt. There are battery chemistries that don't have nickel, but they don't work, especially in cold climates. And when I say cold, I mean like all of Northern North America, big chunk of the US. So um, nickel continues to be consistent across the winning battery chemistries, but it's really interesting to think at nickel. And it didn't really hit me until I hear this from the actual demand, from their perspective, you know, the world's largest nickel producers, if you look at it, and it gets complicated because I'm bundling all this and, you know, they're focused on class one. Um, but if you look at the largest nickel sulfide producers, you've got Indonesia, Russia, Canada, Australia. Um, and it's from their perspective with Ukraine, um, Russia sort of came off the board. So those guardrails got put up, couldn't mm -hmm. do that. They see much of the Indonesian production as being backed so significantly by Chinese money um, that if uh, Taiwan heats up to the extent um, uh, of the Ukraine, it just heats up. And if that puts, you know, uh, the Chinese, and I realize there's much more integration between the Chinese and the global economy versus, you know, a glorified gas station, which is Russia and the global economy. Um, but if, if China, for some reason, is parked in any way like Russia has been, that really complicates where you're going to get your supply for nickel because that then pushes the Europeans back to Canada, Australia. Uh, and then meanwhile, you've got, and that was a European conference, meanwhile, you've got the Americans with the new Inflation Reduction Act out of Washington, where they have defined very tight restrictions, which are you know anti-trade restrictions, saying that a bunch of domestic tax credits, you only get those, and this is one of the things Freeland was referring to, if you qualify with domestic inputs, but within the critical metals mineral space, and this is wonderful news for Canadian juniors, uh, Canada, Australia, randomly South Korea have been defined as domestic, right? Because there is no nickel production in the U.S. There, there's mm -hmm. one mine, Eagle, owned by Lundin. There's a very promising deposit, Tamarack. I looked at buying that with private equity funds seven years ago. Problem then was permitting. Current problem still permitting. Even if Tamarack gets permitted, it's very likely just going to continue to be supply. I, I foresee that going to Lundin and they'll keep that Eagle mill going, but that is not the answer for domestic nickel demand. 
the domestic nickel demand needs to come from somewhere else. And this geopolitical thing is really interesting because you hear from the, the, the car companies and they see these guardrails sort of shrinking in on them. And it's very important, and this is one of my themes, is to be, we're inside those guardrails. Mm -hmm. uh, so as the world becomes very small, and frankly, Canada and Australia is not able to keep up with the forecast uh, gigafactory demand out of Europe. Um, but, and, and obviously, if you think that one through, something's got to give. Uh, you know, price has got to go up extraordinarily mm -hmm. to incent us all to be producing more, maybe. But, you know, it's not the sort of thing where you flick the switch. Um, on on production, so so that's not really the answer. Uh, uh, there will be combinations of uh, battery chemistries with less nickel involved, but regardless of what the answer is, and again, it's likely a combination of a bunch of things happening. Uh, there is going to be a crunch, and it, it's it's very heartening. You're probably hearing it in my responses here to be sitting on a lot of nickel in the ground mm -hmm. in exactly the kind of place where people want to be operating. Yeah. Yeah, all of that well well articulated. I mean, for me, it's it's we're kind of on the precipice of a brave new world here, where the last few decades of this global experiment or globalization experiment starting to disintegrate kind of in real time before our eyes, and mm -hmm. yeah, a, re a return of of na of resource nationalism or at least friendly resource nationalism, right? So again, yeah, just all. I mean, again, we're kind of keep returning to the macro, but it's hard not to when you're in this space because <laughs> it is, it's all it all all the stars align, right? So let's just circle back here and try to get more more uh, pinpointed here in our discussion. Um, yep. Rogue Resources, if it's fair to call it a sister company to EV, right? A lot of the same board, same team. You purchased or EV purchased your your land from Rogue in the spring of 2021. It came with a historical resource from 2010. Of, if you include indicated and inferred, 18 million pounds of about 1% nickel. That took, and I'm just going to burn through this pause. Tell me if I've got something wrong here, right? Yep. And as you did, you, you corrected me before the show here. I thank you for that, right? 22,000 meters is what it took to get those 18 million pounds. So fast forward to now, you have a historical resource. You have to update it. Uh, can you just briefly run through? You've, you've had four phases or three phases thus far go into the ground with a fourth phase uh, upcoming here in very short order. Do you mind running through what you've, what you've accomplished with phase one and two? what you accomplished with phase three, which is a little separate, and then we'll move forward from there. Yeah. So um, you're right. So we inherited this historic resource uh, that basically went down to about 200 meters depth. And that was the, the W4 zone, we'll call it. Um, so that was that 2010 resource, 1%, very good grade. Uh, first thing we did was last year, last summer, uh, so 2021, with what we call phase one, we went in and we drilled, um, we drilled on the flanks so we drilled on the west and the east, tried to understand if the mineralization extended up and down the trend. Um, and we got our first sort of fresh core with our team um, in the W4. Plus, we did uh, some infill shots because we wanted to be able to have uh, samples that would go off for MET analysis. So big success. Uh, we confirmed that W4 extended up and down trend. So that was last summer's drilling. We came out with that news in January of this year, so soon after the IPO when the assays all came back. Um, so that was phase one. Phase two was this year, We the W4 um, goes down to 200 meters, as I mentioned, and we wanted to get some deeper shots. So we went to the other side of a river, which is to the north of the deposit. We did longer drilling, which obviously when you're, you're doing it on the longer angle, it's more expensive because you have more meters before you get to the mineralization. Um, but we did deeper shots between 200 and 400. Uh, and that has been the news from this summer is from the spring drilling. That was our news through summer and in September when we confirmed that that good mineralization, that 1% continues down uh, to what we call the W4 extension between 200 and 400 meters. So now we've got the data set that shows us it very likely is a larger resource. The other thing that the guys interpreted from the combination of last summer's phase one um, and this this spring's phase two is that the the top resource, the historic resource from 2010, was interpreted back then as being three separate lenses. And now they think it's one consistent lens that goes down. So I anticipate with the new resource that we'll come out with at some future date that we're looking at something that is likely larger. Um, and my target is something like double. 
And when I think about the indicated tons, uh, our 2010 resource indicated ton wise was a little under 700,000 uh, tons. And I want to see something that, like double that. Uh, and that would be the new W4. So we will, and I'll come back to this because that's our phase four drilling. Um, so when we park our high grade track and shift to the other track, uh, which is the, the large scale target. So this summer, we drilled 8,400 meters up in the northeastern part of our property, where the mag showed us very interesting dunites, uh, which we think look a lot like Canada Nichols Crawford. Um, and we, we show this in our investor slides, where we felt like the Crawford main zone, um, we, we seem to have 10 kilometers of that mineralization. And they were able to come up with, uh, as they refer to it, a billion tons. Um, and that was a little under two kilometers of a similar type of mineralization. So this summer we did 8,400 meters over, uh, I think it's 1.4 kilometers. Uh, and we'll be coming out with those assay results very soon. Uh, and they'll come out and they should be very boring, consistent news over the next three months about this large scale target that we drilled this summer with our phase three, that 8,400 meters. And this is the stuff that's near surface. We did a bunch of surface sampling and there was a bunch of historic surface sampling, again, because of the outcrop. Um, and it seems as though the grade up there is a little better than 0.25, but we will see when we start coming out with these assays. I, I say that based on the surface samples we did. So that's our, that's our large scale target, which we drilled this summer. That was, that was our phase three. Now phase four drilling, we have a lot of other high grade targets across the Shaw Dome. So we have bolted together and we're continuing to try to do M&A uh, with private companies that own this sort of patchwork. Uh, again, back to that historic production across the Shaw Dome, it, much of it was in different companies. It all fell into different private hands and we're trying to bolt it all back together. But you've got stuff like we own now Langmuir number two, which had a bunch of production for which we have level plans so we know where the high grade is. Mm. Their grade was almost 1.5%. In phase four, I hope for us to do a couple shots into Langmuir number two to speak about additional high grade that we'll then have core on. And it begins to paint this picture of where subsequent high grade would come from after the W4. So phase four is going to be a combination of interesting exploration. Plus, we're going to come back to the W4 and do the infill. So we've got the data to be able to do a new indicated resource um, next year on W4. So that's where we stand on our drilling phases. It's really been sort of W4 focused, then up to the large scale, then we'll come back down to the W4. Uh, on the way there, we'll do some high grade shots. Uh, but right now we're waiting for assays to be coming back on that large scale program we did this summer. Um, and that'll be our news over the next few months. Because what we're setting up here, and back to sort of how many tons we have in the ground, what we're setting up here is for the high-grade business, if I have currently a little under 700,000 tons in this historic 2010 resource, and I can get with our upcoming W4 resource, you know, something that looks a lot bigger than that, um, across the road is a resource that is double the size of ours right now, the Heart resource, um, at one4 nickel, so even better grade. And that's owned by the same privately held group that did the deal with us earlier this mm -hmm. year where we tripled our land package. Mm -hmm. So they're investors of ours now. And they also control the Redstone Mill to our west, which is a permitted 2,000 tons per day mill, which operates now as a toll milling operation, mainly with gold ores that come down from Timmins. Uh, but it sort of opportunistically runs. And, and they know the real value of having a mill as having it consistently running. So they're permitted for 2000 tons per day. In the past, they've done nickel production out of that mill. Um, it's a wonderful asset to have just seven kilometers away. And, and I foresee, Matthew, some sort of combination on that high grade business as being able to piece together what we have as a wonderful uh, starter resource at W4, which I'm hoping is gonna be bigger. And I know there's a resource across the street three and a half kilometers away, which is bigger and higher grade. And then seven kilometers away, mm. a permitted mill exists. So that's kind of my 
high grade idea. And then I think of it in terms of 700,000 ton waves because each of those is a year for the mill, right? Um, and if I can find additional high grade, we can keep that high grade production business going. And, and I think across the Shaw Dome, across the land we have now, there's a huge amount of potential, even at places like Langmuir number two, where we have fine plans um, or level plans, um, there is high, high grade mineralization across our land where we'll be able to keep finding, uh, you know, 700,000 ton blocks to keep an extra year of that mill going. So that's how I think about our high grade business. And that's the work in front of us, uh, both the drilling on our part and sort of how I see the pieces fitting together. And what we're permitting now with the province is the W4 for a mine permit. Um, and, and that's when I talk about our high grade business as hopefully being able to be into production in three to four years. So thank you. Uh, inferring based on what you just said, in terms of a target for a, a truly commercial deposit, is that kind of that eight to 10 million ton range at 1% or what's, what's your target? Yeah, I, I don't want to talk about targets. I want to, so I currently have an indicated historic resource, um, a little under 700,000. And we're, we're doing the work to try to make that bigger. My target for that is double. Um, and, and I feel like there's more of those. Uh, again, back to the fact the Shaw Dome hasn't been explored. There mm -hmm. are more of those down the trend. Um, and then we've also got sort of known resources nearby uh, in private hands. Um, so my intention is to get a business up and running, which begins to look like uh, filling a 2,000 ton per day mill with the grades we're talking about. Um, and, and, and we're not beholden to that mill, even though it's seven kilometers away and it's permitted and exists, you know, just a few hours to our south uh, is Sudbury where they are looking for ore, right? So there is still that option for us to be able to truck the material someplace. Obviously that's, that's not as interesting to me uh, on a number of fronts versus using the permitted existing mill seven kilometers away. Mm -hmm. So those are sort of our, our options. And that's actually the met work we're doing in the lab right now, which I hope comes out beginning of next year with our met report. Um, and SGS is studying the circuit at the nearby permitted mill plus running it down in Sudbury. So we'll at least know where we stand on both those fronts. Mm -hmm few different threads here I'm going to try to clean up because it's just as you're talking, I just have things I want to, you know, just discuss or <laughs> discuss or agree with or whatever, right? Uh, I mean, on, on the one hand, I mean, when I when I look through juniors, I'm looking for infrastructure and I'm looking for, I have a checklist of things and pre-existing mills, permitted mills is absolutely one of them, right? High-level care and maintenance or even actively operating. And so, yeah, like that Redstone mill, like you say, just being a five-minute drive, 10-minute drive away is a, is a big part of the story for me, right? Um, yeah. You also mentioned that, yeah, you... Another thing I look for is uh, valid geolo geological or geophysical theses behind the exploration, right? So that you you have this, and so I mean, this is from my I'm I'm still I remain a layman when it comes to geophysics and geology, but you know, you have this VTEM survey data that looks like there's some pretty consistent looking anomalies that match what you know to be with W4 a pretty healthy nickel mineralization. And so just for people, and again, I'll bring up this I'll bring up this image for for people watching on YouTube, but you have this this geological thesis that you know that the, the geophysics match the geology in one on one area and then you have the opportunity for like a, a valid expectation for future discovery so yeah again just speaking as a personal private reach uh, personal private investor these are boxes that ev check, checks for me right um and, and matthew that's exactly what paul's been whispering in my ear for years and that's why it's so exciting now for us to bolt the land package together We've, we've gone through all the historic data. We have a really neat uh, snapshot, a cartoon in our slides, which comes from a very thick report from uh, geophysics experts. You know, you and I are both laymen in this field, but the smartest guys in the world, or amongst the smartest guys in the world, is a group out of Colorado, Condor, uh, with whom we've worked. And they've taken all the historic data, working with Paul, and the place just lights right up. I'd encourage you to you know, show that slide because mm. uh, it really shows the dome. Um, mm. So this is the thing. My, my geos are excited to drill, but geos are always excited to drill. I'm excited for my geos to drill because I see the historic production um, and, you know, these geophysics guys, for example, saying this is really interesting. 
one of our biggest issues, and we say this a bunch, is prioritizing our opportunities, which is a good place to be. But back to the commercial story, I think of it in terms of 700,000 ton blocks to potentially fill a 2,000 ton per day mill for a year. And that's, mm. that's how I think about my high grade business. Mm. And so circling back here, just trying to be wary of the time and trying to respect the fact that, yeah, not to st stretch us on for three hours here. Um, <laughs> so you did mention MET testing, and I know that, of course, it's material info, so I can't ask for anything that the market doesn't already know. But do you just, so historically in 2010, they had about 80% recovery rates. Uh, some discussion about maybe complex mineralogies. Uh, can you just maybe discuss where you're at with that or your expectations around MET testing? Yeah, so um, again, we're in the lab now. We'll have the results out, I hope, early next year. Um, in terms of the, the MET results, you can read into, we're redoing it. So we anticipate we'll get um, better results. Um, I should say my technical team feels that way. Um, and a couple of reasons on that, Matthew. One, we, we've looked at what they did and we have SGS doing some different stuff. That's one. Um, secondly, in terms of it being complex mineralogy, you know, back to the historic production out of the Shaw Dome with these high grade deposits. So uh, including at the mill, Redstone, um, they had that or better recoveries in operations. So, so these are the reasons for spending dollars on rerunning mm. the network mm -hmm. because we think it could be better. Um, but again, I, I don't want to get into the detail on that because we haven't been talking about it publicly, but that'll mm. be early 2023 results from the SGS work uh, that we're deep into now. Excellent. And then maybe do you mind just that we have a couple of resources that have been, that we the market is waiting on. Can you maybe give us just a general, I mean, obviously I know that the only thing constant is change, right? That, 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 <laughs> Deadlines don't necessarily happen, and that's just part of the sector, right? But can you just – when might we expect a couple of resources coming out of you guys? Yeah, so those two resources are a maiden resource on the car lane, our, our large-scale target. And I mentioned, you know, we've done the drilling on that, 8,400 meters. That's done. That's our news. The assay is coming back over the next few months. And we're already working with the QP on that. It'll be the same group, um, Caracal Creek, who did our, our – our first technical study. Uh, and they're also the same group that did the initial resources on Crawford. So um, our maiden resource on Carlang, uh, we anticipate will be early next year. So first calendar quarter of 2023. The updated W4 resource uh, will be of a similar timing. And that will obviously, if we do it with a focus on the indicated, um, that will come on the heels of us having the assay results from phase four. So if we're drilling phase four uh, later this year, so in the winter, uh, then the assays come back and then that all contributes in to the updated W4 resource. If we pull up where we are now, which would then be a combination of indicated plus a chunk of inferred. Um, so if we push a resource out before, for example, we do the phase four drilling, you know, that, that's an option. Um, and then that would be, you know, for sure, early uh, 2023. So that's, that's, that's sort of where we stand, Matthew. Um, and those are the options we're working through now. Um, and, and then also, I mentioned we're, we're permitting W4. And we're also looking at, and this kind of puts uh, us out in front of where we're at in terms of the 43-101 timeline. But we're also looking at uh, production scenarios, or I should say development scenarios, uh, with nearby uh, resources. So uh, it's a really interesting thing, especially when you're talking to the regulators about uh, shared access for underground resources. You know, from the regulator's perspective, smaller footprint, all good news. Um, and these are things we're working through uh, around sort of an assumption of what a resource could look like at RW4, and then especially, as I mentioned, the neighbors across the street, um, because there's really interesting potential there on, on how you develop the two together. So we're working on a bunch of fronts, uh, but back to the 43101 resource front, it's the Maiden Car Lang uh, beginning of next year, um, the updated W4 soon after that, if we wait for the phase four data, or around similar timing, if we just crank something out before we have the phase four data. 
Excellent. No, thank you. And, you know, this is one of those sectors where patience is a virtue, right? That as long as the team is executing, it might take a few years, but people will join this sector because of those, that opportunity for outsized returns, right? So, I mean, Mm -hmm. always nice to know that there are catalysts coming down the pipe in the short term, but yeah, you've got to really patience, right? Patience, patience. Um, Nearing the end here, but I, I would be remiss if I didn't ask you about just your green initiatives, carbon cost. Could you just kind of run through why, what that is and why that sets you apart as well? Yeah, so I know everybody says the same thing, right? You know, the consistency now with uh, uh, critical metals junior companies are we complain about our valuation being low and uh, we say how we're how green we are. But I say all that. Uh, we have trademarked the term clean nickel. It's in the DNA of our company. What that means for us is our focus really is on this track one, the high grade. Um, commercially, I think I can get it into production the quickest, obviously. But then also from a carbon cost perspective, I think we have the opportunity to uh, really do something special with the new operation we plan to build. Um, And you can do things like in Northern Ontario, we draw hydropower. So everything we electrify would have a very low carbon cost attached to it. So we can have full electrification of both of our mine development and our mine operations. So that's material movement, that's men and materials. Um, and it, it's neat to look now at underground development where, you know, I have pushed ramps underground with traditional um, gas powered rubber tired equipment and, and the ramp slope you have to do um, is radically different than what they're looking at now with um, with doing monorail or rail based. So you can electrify monorail um, and have a much steeper ramp getting down to your 400 meters depth, which I was referring to as the bottom of what we think the W4 extension could be. So uh, that all contributes back, if you're electrifying all of that, uh, into what your carbon cost looks like. Uh, we're also working in other areas uh, where we've got a neat thing going. We're, we're deep in the lab in partnership with the federal government. We're doing R&D with a group at New Brunswick around bio leaching. So this is like, uh, as has been used in Scandinavia, Australia and China for bioleaching of base metals. Um, we're looking at it now potentially to be VAT based, uh, where potentially with the nearby plant, the 2000 ton per day permitted redstone, maybe we have the concentrate come out uh, into bioleaching VAT tanks. And from that, mm-hmm. we create nickel sulfate. So from a, a clean nickel perspective, that's a wonderful place to be. Because if we can pull that off, that is producing nickel sulfate, which is actually the product that could go to the gigafactories that are being built in Southern Ontario. Mm -hmm. And I'll tell you, Matthew, Mm -hmm. that's the thing that really turns on the government when they hear that, um, right? Mm -hmm. We wouldn't have to deal with a smelter. So part of our clean nickel umbrella includes research we're doing in the lab on bioleaching. In addition, we're doing research in the lab uh, and other companies have similar geology tars around carbon sequestration. So carbon capture. So the dunites, especially up on the Carlang, when those are exposed uh, to the atmosphere, they naturally sequester carbon, which is really neat. Uh, And we see that on our outcrop. Our outcrop has like a a charcoal on the outside, which is the carbon that's come down and it's bonded to the rock. So we're testing in the lab with the University of British Columbia, the sequestration potential, the potential to store carbon. But the neat thing, if I compare us to some of our competitors for whom that low grade or large scale target is their core business. Us having the two tracks means um, when I'm talking about a 1% underground grade, that's the kind of grade that gets turned into production. For companies that are just running with the equivalent of our large scale target, they need to be throwing everything into the mix, including the carbon credit value of carbon capture. So for us, when we analyze that, that's kind of a need to have. Sorry, it's a nice to have, not a need to have. Mm -hmm. Um, But it all folds back into the clean nickel work we're doing, which is from the mining where we're rethinking it. I should also mention around the potential for ore sortation, again, electrified, Hmm. so low carbon cost, which lifts your potential head grade. And then we're looking at uh, the carbon capture um, and also the bio leach, uh, which we're well down the path on. And these are all things, Matthew, that we would be pulling up and shooting when we pull out a 43-101, we would you know, show where we're at with each of those phases. And that's all back to the Mm -hmm. clean nickel. And to summarize, I want to be bottom quartile 
with the carbon cost attached to my nickel units. And that really is a turn on for the new demand, whether it's the battery companies or the car companies, to hear and see the evidence of the work we're doing on clean nickel, which is EV nickel's trademark. I just I find it so fascinating. We really are on the verge of a revolution in this sector in terms of greening the space. And it's yep. just, yeah, I really find it so interesting, all the different kind of ideas that are being bandied about. So, yeah, I give you a kudos for that as well. Um, yeah. with, this is the end, Sean. Parting, parting thoughts for you, I guess? Yeah, so... Um, I, I've referred, referred to it a few times that much of what I say, I think, is probably consistent with uh, with other folks. Um, but what 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 I would want folks to look at is the team and the team's experiences. You know, that starts with me. Um, I have tremendous breadth on the things I've done. Um, I look different. Uh, actually, maybe I was starting to look very similar, but I have a different background than uh, many of the other folks who run junior mining companies. And I think that's really what these companies need as we're going into a much more complex world where we can mm. try to find out where the opportunities are. So it's sort of directly aligned with what my career has been building to, to this point, because if we're going to, if I'm going to run this thing that I'm describing, there's a lot happening. And that's, that's, that's my usual thing. So team wise as me, and then I don't think anybody has a better technical geological team and we'll add to that group as well as we go down the path evolving closer to development. Um, so I would start with the people. And then, you know, our asset is is hugely interesting. They have an enormous land package. And we have these two tracks as well, Matthew. So it's um, I'm not just, you know, trying to preach to the choir about uh, lower grades are going to have to become economic. Let's say they do. But meanwhile, I've got my first track, the high grade. So from a new investor mm -hmm. perspective and overlaying all this is my ski slope of a stock chart. Um, it's, it's an opportunity now to get in at what looks like a valuation that reflects, you know, two and a half, three times cash we have in the bank. Well, yeah. Well then thank you, Sean, if that's it. I mean, I appreciate it, it was an interesting and well articulated, well articulated interview. Thanks to our listeners. If you want more, if you are interested and you want more information, you can go to evnickel.com. There's a pretty strong website there. As for me, you can find me under the name Junior Resource Investing on Spotify, YouTube, or your favorite podcasting hosting mechanism. Sean, I appreciate your time. Thanks again. Yeah, thanks, Matthew. Thanks everybody for tuning in. Have a good day.